Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Well, let's review just a little bit. Remembered of Yah, Zechariah. That's what our Father does for us. He remembers us. And in the fifth chapter that we covered in the last lecture, he said, hey, make a great big sign and let everybody know if you don't follow this, it's going to be a curse upon you. And then he showed this... Uh, little lady from Shinar, which is to say Mystery Babylon, put her in a basket and she wanted to fly away to save her soul. And uh, that's what the sign said. Don't teach my people to fly to save their souls. And there they were caught between heaven and earth. You don't want to get caught there. Father has work for you here. That's why you put the gospel armor on and in place. And then in the sixth chapter, he showed us that we would receive the branch. And what a wonderful thing that is. That's Messiah. And let's come to chapter 7, and let's go with it. Here we go. Our father just a little bit unhappy with the children. Let's read it. Chapter 7, verse 1, Word of wisdom from our father in Yeshua's name, and it reads, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chelsu. This is after the captivity, and this is, this is a, a, a Chaldean name of a month, and it's our, the close of our November, early December. Okay? This is two years after the last vision. So we've got two years transpired. Let's pick it up there and go with it. Verse 2. When they had sent unto the house of God... They, they sent two people to the house of God, okay? Who did they send? Sherazar, that's the uh, prince of, of uh, fire, and Regimelech, which is to say a friend of the king, or it can be the king's heap, two, two different. They sent these two over to see what God might say and, and sent them and their men to pray before the Lord, to get the word. Understand what's happening. And again, by these Chaldean names, you automatically know by the date that we're, we're past the captivity here a little bit. Verse 3. And to speak unto the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts, and to the prophet, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself, as I have done these so many years, and most people think it was the 70 years of the captivity, as Jeremiah had warned them, you're going into captivity 70 years, and so it was. Okay. <clears throat> and um, there's something, I want to give you a clue. This fast here of the fifth month, it's not a fast God told them to go into. Okay. He sent Jeremiah tell them, you're going into captivity and you're going to be there X number of years. And here they weep and, and uh, set up these fast days, not feast days, but days to sing sad songs. God did not tell them to do that. And they did not consult with God about it. So they did this all on their own. So God is kind of prompting them here just a little bit um, in, in doing this. Um, uh, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself? Verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests. You get them all, preachers and all. Saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years... Did you at all fast unto me, even to me? Did you forget all about me, God is saying? How, how come you left me out of it? it? But It was so religious, Father. We had to have these fast days and weep and mourn. 
Um, <clears throat> our Father doesn't appreciate that. You know, when he pronounces a sentence upon you, you better kiss the paddle and do as God would lead you and say to you and be ready to serve him. He, he's not happy. Father's not happy with them. <clears throat> he said, how come you left me out of the equation? Why didn't you ask me about the fifth and the seventh month? Now, of course, the fast of the fifth month is where they overrun Jerusalem. They lost at the temple. And, and the fast of the seventh is where, um, where the, um, um, the murder of Gedaliah. Okay, they had to have a little fast there. Everything bad happened that Father allowed to let them bring upon themselves. They had to have a fast over it, yeah. But God's saying, D did you ever really take time to stop and think about what I might want? You know, you want to do this in your own life also. Sometimes you get so busy trying to align yourself and arrange yourself, you forget to talk to him. Don't ever make that mistake. Verse 6, and when you did eat, Father's still talking to him. When you did eat, after the fast was over, and when you did drink, did not you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Again, you did it for your own fellowship. You did not drink unto me. You did not remember me. You left me again out of the equation. Whether you were fasting or eating, do you even remember me at all, God is saying. Verse 7. Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets? Why didn't you listen to Jeremiah? When Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain, when, when everything was going smooth, and you started turning away from me, why didn't you listen to Jeremiah? Why didn't you listen to the prophets? And had you repented, this would not have happened in the first place. You understand? What God is saying, you left me again. Even back in the good times, you left me out of the equation. Not a good thing to do, my friend. You leave God out of your life and, well, he never blesses me. Well, I can understand why. If you never talk to him, you never tell him you love him. You never read the letter he sent to you telling you how to find happiness how to be complete. Why, why should he answer your prayer? You don't deserve it. You're leaving him out of the equation of your life by not following his instructions. He does not like that. Verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto Zacharias, saying, verse 9, Thus speak the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute. Oh, I love that word. That, that's a military term. That means get it on. Action. Execute. True judgment. And show mercy and compassions. Every man to his brother. Now, a brother is one born of the womb of Israel. He's saying you execute it. You do it. You execute judgment. You, that means you do what's right. And when you do what's right, you're sure not going to leave God out of the equation. You're going to go by his orders of judgment. You're going to go by his orders and his advice as how to treat a brother. Well, I thought you were supposed to do your brother before he does you. That's not biblical. Okay. You're supposed to love your brother. There are many times a brother, you may have to set him aside. You may, may have a little problem with him as you were given instructions in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6, how to handle the situation. Still, don't treat him as an enemy. Okay. You're supposed to love your brother. You're supposed to love your family. And again, the terminology here in the Hebrew means born of the womb of Israel. That's a brother. Well, what is a neighbor then? A neighbor's going to come up. You need to know. A neighbor is one that is adopted into the house of Israel by the loving the Lord Jesus Christ, the branch that was sent in the prior chapter. Okay, verse 10. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. Don't, don't take advantage of people. And let none 
of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. You, you get along with each other. You know, imagining evil is imagining things that don't actually exist. You, you're, you, you image things and, well, I wonder if this could happen or that could happen, and you just fret yourself all up over something that hasn't happened, probably will not happen, but yet in your mind you've e imagined it. Okay. Waste of time. Biggest waste of time in the world is worried about what your brother is going to do to you when probably he loves you. So uh, do, wh what is justice? He did not say me, that means doing what's right. Okay. And he put a word on there that I just love. He said, execute. That means execute the command, get it on, do it. Don't play games with God. Don't leave God out of the equation. Read the letter he sent you and love your brother. And you know what will happen in return? Your brother will love you. Maybe, okay? At least it's, uh, the, the blame is certainly not on your shoulders if that be the case. And with God, that makes it just perfect. Verse 11. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. This has kind of a pu pulling away the shoulder has kind of a twofold meaning. It's kind of a Hebraism. It, it means you keep your shoulder to the wheel doing your part. It means they, they kind of backed off from doing with their brother and didn't do their part, slacked off. And not only did they slack off from pulling their shoulder back away from the load, okay, but they stopped their ears and wouldn't hear anything right or wrong. I mean, they're all wrapped up in themselves. That's, that's the wrong way to be, my friend, and you're headed for bad trouble when that event happens. You know, uh, if you had ever worked a team of horses, this would mean more to you than you could imagine because you get a lazy old horse that'll lay back because you have two horses hooked to two single trees and those single trees are hooked up on one big double tree. And if one of them lays back, the double tree swaps and goes forward and the other one's hanging back and one has to do all the work. Well, that, that's what God's talking about. That's where this idiom comes from. Okay. And, and um, you're supposed to, keep, God wants you to keep your shoulder to the wheel, of the, the, to the load, okay, and pull your part of the load. That simply means in getting along. And what's the subject? Justice, judgment. Doing what's right. <clears throat> well, but what have we got here? We've got a bunch of people that are <laughs> singing sad songs and feeling sorry for themselves. I mean, they destroyed the temple. They murdered Gedaliah. Things just went worse and worse. Stand up. Take care of business. If they had listened to Jeremiah and the prophets, they wouldn't have been in that shape in the first place if they had listened to God. When, when, what are you saying here? You've shut your ears up. You won't hear me. What am I going to do about it? Verse 12. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. I mean, they, they were hard as a rock. Lest they should have, hear the law. That's to say God's word. And the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit, the Rurach, by the former prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. You ticked me off. You would not listen. I sent you letters. I sent you prophets. I warned you. You kept uh, sticking your head right up and nose right up in the air and you would not listen to me. What do you expect me to do? I dropped the hammer on you. Okay. And then you have to make your little fast days and cry for yourself. Pity, 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 pity parties. See, Father doesn't approve of that. They should have talked to the Father about this fasting business, these pity parties. And, and what fathers tell them, I warned you, if you hadn't stopped your ears, you'd have heard the warning, and it would not have been necessary. That's true to this day, my friend. If you listen to God's word, even in the troubled times we're in, if you'll do it God's way, you'll be blessed. 
If any problems do come along, you'll know how to take care of business. Don't get on a pity party because of things that God has predicted, prophesied, promised would come to pass if you did certain things. Verse 13, therefore it is come to pass, not maybe, it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, they can pray all they want to. Now, I'm not going to hear it. <laughs> he never answers my prayer. Do you blame him? Do you blame him? Well, he, he just won't listen to me. I don't blame him. If you, do, if you leave him out of the equation of your life, if you never talk to him, you never speak to him, you never let him know you love you, love him, and you never try to follow what the word he has sent to you through the prophets as to how, what consummates the end of this age, why would you ever think for a moment he would want to bless you? You don't deserve it. Well, I've never, I've, I've never heard anyone talk that hard. Well, God does. But you know something? Execute what's right and be blessed. It makes all the difference in the world. All you have to do is execute judgment. Do it. Study your Father's Word. Learn it. Open your ears to the law, which is to say simply God's advice. And, and talk to your Father, and He'll kick a lot of the big rocks out of the road of your life. And he will hear your prayers and he will answer them on your repentance and doing what's right, executing judgment. Uh, our father loves his children. Boy, does he love them. But he loves to hear from them. You know, some say, well, I oh, wonder why I didn't know he had time for that. Well, you're his family. You know, don't you think any parent loves to hear from their children? Any parent that the children just, the only time you would hear from them if they were ever in a jam or something, or not much offspring. You're not going to reach out there and bless them all that much. But if they're caring and loving, if they have a pain, you have a pain. And you're going to fix it as best you can. Well, that's the way our Father is. He has feelings. So, all the Father's saying, I'm going to treat you just like you've treated me. I warned you. I cried to you. I tried to reach you. You would not pay any attention, and now you're squalling to me. Answer my prayers, God. I'm not going to hear you. You don't deserve it. So, you, I, the reason I'm emphasizing this, I want you to take inventory in your own life. Because a lot of people have prayers unanswered for this very reason. When all you had to do is warm up and let God know you love Him, that you're a believer, and that you love the Son, the branch, and be blessed, then He's going to hear you. Now, I have to, I have to insert here in this case a reason that a lot of people, well, I, I tell him every day that I love him. And I, 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 I really, really, really do love him. And I go to church every time the doors are open. And I follow him, but he won't answer my prayer. But hey, wait, just, you're not that old gal in the basket about halfway between heaven and earth where you've learned to fly to save your soul, have you? You're, you're not part of that chapter five bunch, are you? Because he made that big sign to warn you about those that would teach his children to fly to save his soul. Why would he answer their prayers? If they've been misled to that point and have twisted and turned and go against God, then you might take a little inventory there also because you're not listening. You're not practicing the judgment. You're not executing the command. And that's very necessary. You can't do it some man's tradition way. You've got to do it God's way. 
You that might have trouble with that, you might order to read. You know, he sent a prophet named Ezekiel. And Ezekiel in chapter 13, verses 20 to 25, told you about this flyaway business. You might order to read it. You see, your soul and your deception depends on it because you know who that flyaway message is. He told you it's right out of Babylon. And it's those that believe in the false Messiah's message of flyaway that are deceived, then you can understand why God wouldn't answer your prayers if you're praying to the wrong Messiah. Verse 14, But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations. This whirlwind is a little bit on the strong side. It means a tempest. I really scattered them among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. They, they left me out of the equation whereby there were no blessings and there were no rewards or awards from Almighty God. Wherever they went, you leave God out of the equation, that's what you get. Okay. So uh, you, we need to learn the lesson. And that's how our Father does. Now, the next chapter is quite different than this. It has to do with the restoration. That's the scattering. Now we're going to do the restoration of Israel, of God's children, the children He scattered, that would not listen, that left God out of the equation. How precious it is. Chapter 8, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. I love her. I'm jealous that she goes flirting around with other religions, other beliefs, instead of listening to me. We do have a jealous father. And you know something? Uh, how would you feel if you had created the earth, if you had created all the beautiful animals and nature, if you'd created all the, the beautiful oceans and seas and heavens, skies, stars, and created the oxygen that we breathe, and, and uh, seasons that can be so profitable and then have a bunch of kids that ignore you, that want to mess up what you created so beautiful, do you think he would be happy with them? Of course not. That's why he's jealous when they turn to someone else, false teachings, and, oh, but it's so religious. Well, false teachings are always so religious. But Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. It's the Word of God. It's the law of God. It's the word you're supposed to follow. It makes him jealous. And I hope you can understand from my analogy how he would feel that way. I mean, he made it real good for us. It's beautiful. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion. This is future, beloved. The Holy Spirit was with us, but this will be de facto, de jure, I should say, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Now tell me again, let's get that straight. Now where is God going to dwell? Because I get confused easily. Jerusalem, Mount Zion, it's His favorite place, His eternal resting place. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. Uh, why? Because God's going to be there. And only truth shall come from there. No lies out of there anymore. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Well, what's that Ruach mountain holy? What, what, what mountain is that? Mount Zion. Okay. The mountain of the Lord. And do you know what glory this is? It's the Shekinah glory. Because when you utilize the word Shekinah, 
do you know what that means in the Hebrew tongue? It means God dwells there. We just read it. It's like the final verses of the great book of Ezekiel in um, uh, Ezekiel 48, uh, long about verse 35. Do you know what it says? It says, Yahweh Shema. And God dwells there. And that's where he's coming to. That's his favorite place. Don't ever let anybody con you into thinking otherwise. Like, well, I, I, I need to fly away. Well, why do you want to fly away when God's coming to Jerusalem? Where, where are you going to fly to? You're going to be like that old heifer in the basket in chapter 5? Listen to men's lies? Babble in confusion? You don't want to go there. That's not judgment, my friend. God has warned you. He, made, he said, make that sign 15 by 30 feet and fly her up there where everybody has a warning. I want them to be warned. Don't participate in this or you're going to a bad place. Well, most people can understand that. But here, he lets you know exactly where he's coming back to. So if somebody tells you you're going to fly away somewhere else or go somewhere else where God is, God's not going to be there because he's coming here. I'm coming to Jerusalem. I'm going to dwell there. Let's go with the next verse. Verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. I mean, multi days. He can hardly get around, but he'll be safe there. Verse 5 And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Ver uh, unbelievable. I mean, can you see your kids playing out in the street today? A busy street? Three and four year olds. I mean, they're out there, right there, galloping around. Then it'll be safe. Verse 6, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Do you think that wouldn't be wonderful? Now, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people are so careless with the Word of God that they take this and say, Well, isn't this the millennium? Yes, it is. Anytime God has returned through the Son, it's the millennium. Well, here we are in that, the Lord's day, and here the people are old. There's old people out there, and there's still little children born. You see, you'd be making a gross error. It's an analogy of safety. Anytime that an elderly couple can sit in a swing on the front porch by the street in the late afternoon and the evening, and be totally safe. It means there's no crooks around. It means there won't be anybody there that would murder or rob old folk. Because, I, quite frankly, I'll tell you where the robbers will be at that time. Okay, but and, and the fact that little children playing in the street means it's perfectly safe there. It's just an analogy. Everyone will be the same age on the Lord's Day. There's, everybody will be in spiritual bodies because at the last trump we're all changed into spiritual bodies and therefore you all become the age that God created you, which is to say uh, anytime someone has seen an angel, like um, let's say like the, the women who went to the tomb after Christ's resurrection saw two young people, they look young because they are. And there's no such thing as age in the spiritual body. But this is an analogy only, okay? It means it's perfectly going to be safe there. And, and God says, you know something, I long for this. It, it's marvelous in my eyes. I hope it is in yours. Well, boy, it sure is in mine. If any time we needed safety in the streets, it's now. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. You're not going to have to worry about suicide bombers. You're not going to have to worry about uh, uh, evil people. God says, I'm going to save my children. 
and, and he will. That's his promise. This is the restoration of his children. And we're coming up on that time of teaching and then the day of judgment. And then if we still have people that go against the Word of God, they're not going to be around. Okay, God has a place for them. Verse 8, And I will bring them, this is the, the believers, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people. That's not low ami as it was in, in the book of Hosea, but ami. Ami meaning my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. No, no hanky-panky, no deception, no false teaching, but the pure Word of God coming from the very throne of God taught by the Zadok, the priest of the Zadok, to all the peoples of the world at that time whereby they have an opportunity all people to hear the Word of God without all the interference of Satan's little ones and men on ego trips trying to make a name for themselves instead of our Heavenly Father. None of that will be present at that time. This is restoration time. This is the time we look forward to. This is the Lord's day, not somebody else's. I said, this is the Lord's day. He's it. And praise God for that. Verse 9. And thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. Ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. That, well, what is that house? It's the many-membered body of Christ. The day that the foundation was laid, who laid it? Zerubbabel. And that house is built through the prophets. Well, who are the prophets? Well, how, how about Zechariah to try on for size? How about Hosea? How about Jeremiah? How about Isaiah? How about uh, Moses? Moses was a prophet. And even David himself, David was a prophet. How about the prophets of God's Word? All of them. They have warned us. They have taught us. But that foundation, uh, be strong. But we need, to, we need to fast and cry and weep and moan. No, you don't. That's not what God wants out of you. Bunch of whimper and wimps. He doesn't have any time for them. I want you to be strong. Why? Because He's given you reason to be strong. He's given the promise of His return. Remembered of Yah, Zechariah. That's what this book is about. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with my little children or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love. And we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. Let, let's don't judge people. It's very wrong to judge people. You simply teach the Word and set the example and let the chips fall wherever they may. Never, never apologize for the Word of God. 
You see, we have a judge. It's our Father. And He doesn't need our help in judgment. Okay, You're supposed to discern uh, what is right and wrong and execute judgment. And that's where it ends. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. You got a prayer request? We can do away with that number. We can do away with the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He's your father. And he loves you. But he wants to hear you love him. Simply say it. Let him know. Communicate with him. Communicate, communicate, communicate. 90% of all troubles is because of lack of communication. So don't have trouble between you and Father. All you have to do is communicate. That means love Him. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going with Anne from Indiana. <clears throat> if you are a fellow, if you see a fellow Christian doing wrong, are you supposed to tell them? That, doesn't that sound just a little bit judgmental on your part? Do you know what one of the greatest sins in the world is to judge somebody? Um, what, what you do is you set the example by being a good Christian, and the fact that God blesses you and you are successful grabs attention. In other words, you're salty and you salt the area that you're in and people want that. Okay, They savor it. So simply doing what's right. But you know, you go around butting into other people's business and it can drive them away from you quite a bit. Okay, So that's not the way you correct it. Okay, And, not, and Exactly what did Jesus change from the Old Testament besides blood sacrifices? He did not change blood sacrifices. Haven't you ever read Colossians chapter 2? He fulfilled blood sacrifices. Have you ever read Hebrews chapter 10? For one in all times, He became that blood sacrifice. He didn't, he didn't change anything. As a matter of fact, in the great book of Matthew, chapters 5 and 6, he says, I, ch I change not one little jot of the law, which means the Old Testament, did not change anything, but he fulfilled quite a bit of it. That's where the knowledge of Christ comes into being. Okay. Uh, J.C. from Texas, a teenager, and what is, can you recommend a good devotional book to go along with my Bible? Second, should I get a companion Bible in a Strong's Concordance for me and my dad to use? That's, that is the um, uh, devotional book you need to go along with your study. Okay, You don't need some prettied up, flowery thing that some man has written. You need the Word of God. And what, what the Companion Bible and the Strong's Concordance does for you as, a, as an English-speaking person, then you can break, uh, like for example, um, s certain words that I have used today, like uh, I scattered the people and I said, this is a little stronger with that wind, a tempest. You can check that out, see, with that Strong's Concordance. And that gives you a peek into what the scriptures actually said. Because Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic are fixed languages, but many words do have more than one meaning. And you're giving men credit that translated into English that they chose the right meaning, so you need to see both of them to have a, a, a mature line. I'm not saying the word is wrong, it, it, it's correct but you need to have the more, the fuller outlook at it, okay? And I'm so proud of you for wanting to study. You dig deep. Uh, Greg from Pennsylvania. I'm a new student who enjoys studying the Word of God and loves your way of teaching it. My question is on the cherubim. I understand they are to guard God's throne. Question, why does God need protection? Thank you and God bless you. He does not his throne does, okay? But if he's if he is I am that I am, that means I'll be wherever I want to be. Well, 
the he had that uh, what what is part of the altar the mercy seat it's the seat of Christ okay that's through which salvation would come and that was to be protected as the two cherubims on it and and uh, unfortunately one fell that is to say Lucifer he wanted to sit on the mercy seat which is a messiah connotation meaning he wanted to be messiah and that's what the cherubim are to protect it from is men's own um, shortcomings. God must give all of his children free will to love him or to love somebody else whereby he knows he has the real thing. Uh, God can't force somebody to love him. Love generates from within each entity. Uh, Luke from Arizona, please explain Revelation 19.4, the four beasts, and why are they also, are they, what are they there for? That's amazing how one question follows another. It's the same question, actually. When, when the cherubim, who had feelings and could love and could understand, uh, failed, God created the zoi, or the zoon, according to which language you wish to say it in. And the zoon, or the zoi, these beasts, it would be better to translate it for your understanding, living creatures. They do not have the ability to do anything other than to protect that throne. I'll say that again. God created them for one purpose and one purpose only. It's to correct, to, to, to guard that mercy seat. Whereas the cherubim failed, he created the zoon or the zoi, whichever language you wish to call them. And um, uh, they will not be in the eternity because their souls are not such as ours, okay? Because they do not have the privilege of disloving God. They must, they are automatically fixed to love, loyalty, and protect. A June from Oregon. I, I did hear a question that someone asked if the Antichrist had a flesh body. You said no, that he was supernatural, so will his b body look like a flesh body? Being a fallen angel, his real body must be a heavenly body. So how do we recognize him when we are in our flesh bodies being supernatural? Is he able to look and be anything that he wishes? Perhaps I have answered my own question. I've learned that he will come in as the fake Christ, bringing prosperity and peace at the sixth trump. That is correct. Um, what was Adam made in the image of? God and the angels. So therefore, um, uh, the angels have a body in this earth age and heaven age exactly the same, only a different substance. But the likeness is exact, okay? In other words, all people, when God said, let us create man in our, plural, our image, he meant all of us that were with him. In other words, you look, j just as Christ was God here on earth, this is why Jesus would say, and this is why God would say, let us create man in our image. He created Christ in his very own image. If you've seen Christ, you've seen God. Okay. And when you look at yourself, that's as you were in heaven. Okay, same image. So those bodies are the same. Even though he is supernatural, he still has a very beautiful body as is described in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 concerning the king of Tyre. God said, I made you the full pattern. That means it's beautiful to look upon. He earned it and then he went bad. Uh, so he'll be here. We will recognize him by his actions. Evelyn from New Mexico. Uh, thank you. Um, I have been studying with you for 28 years and I still have a question somehow has slipped by me. When we are in the millennium, will we be in God's time frame of one day or will we still be in 1,000 years as we are now? Being we will be in the Spirit. Thank God for the knowledge He has given this ministry. I love you all. Well, thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, 
it would not matter what you wanted to call it because as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. Okay. But we are in spiritual bodies and we will be in one day. And I, I, I feel that that one day overrides because it's a special day. It's the Lord's day. Okay. And thank goodness that it is a thousand of our years long because we've got a lot of work to do. That's, that is the final of having the ability to save people for Father to save people, for people to make their mind up, to be persuaded that our Heavenly Father is of a truth. Many people have not had that opportunity. And our Father is totally fair in judgment. He will not choose someone that has been ignorant of certain things until they come to full knowledge and then make a decision to go wrong. Um, Many people, inasmuch as God is totally fair, I'll just give one more little footnote. Do not please let it confuse you. I'm not going to digress. This is a fact. If God chose the election before the foundation of this world, they were chosen in spiritual bodies. They did not have the weakness of flesh to persuade them to do wrong. Therefore, God will make the final decision on all in spiritual bodies or it would be an unfair thing. I said the final decision. Uh, if you don't understand, put that one on the shelf. Wilma from Oklahoma. I have always wondered why David picked up or chose five smooth stones out of the brook if he used only one stone to take out the giant Goliath. Did, he, did you suggest or did I just imagine that the other four stones will be used in the end time to take out the four hidden dynasties, political, religious, financial, and educational. Well, actually, the, the five were because through him, it was what he was saying. This is why Christ would say, out of the mouth of babes had to do with little David winning that victory. Because Goliath was stomping up and down saying, I'm going to feed you to the birds, your corcus to the birds, and David said, I come with Almighty God protecting me and giving me the strength and the power. And he picked up five stones, which is grace. Okay. And the grace of Almighty God and the words that came from that child's mouth uh, gave him the victory over Goliath. And, and those same four stones left. And... Um, or that part of grace that will always be with us that will give us that final victory also. Okay, So Donna from Louisiana, can Satan put thoughts in your mind? Is he allowed to do that or is it coming from ourselves? Well, basically he can cause events to happen that might cause you to think on certain things, but you're in control of your own faculties. Okay. Unless there's a toxic or mental imbalance, okay? Uh, the flesh body, unfortunately, can put many things in our minds because of our senses. Our, our body has senses that let us know, for example, when you're hungry, when you're hot, when you're cold. And all those senses run through the central nervous system. Th this is why that the word atosh in the Hebrew tongue would and Atish would be used concerning Satan saying, surely we, you can partake of that tree. And it's the tree that this is the trunk and these are the limbs. And that central nervous system knows good from an evil, okay, in his case, where we're supposed to only know good. But um, the body can have a great influence on ourselves. But a Christian, a strong Christian, Satan cannot put thoughts in our minds uh, unless we allow it, okay? I say, I will repeat, unless we allow it. Uh, Mary from Virginia, question, what is an easy way to tell my son that the rapture is just a crazy theory? We talk about God's word a lot. Um, well, Mary, it's kind of a, t you, you just have to be honest and be gentle and you know your son, and God has given you that chore. Um, 
if you need to fortify yourself, look on our tape list and, and order the rapture theory or doctrine question mark. And it will, I think there's two tapes in that, and it will, it will uh, educate you in all the scripture you need to document that. But be gentle and, uh, you know, yesterday's lecture concerning the two, the woman taken up in the basket, that's old mystery Babylon of the end times. That's what that word Sinar means. It's Babylon, okay? And she's the old sister Babylon of the end times. Going to fly away. And unfortunately, many people are deceived into crawling into that basket because they truly believe they're going to fly away. And it's a tradition of men, not of God. And this is why God wanted that big sign made. So you can use that or our, God will show you. He'll lead you. Marilyn from Illinois. Where, is the script, where in the scripture does it give us a guideline how a, to protect ourselves in the coming days of peril? All of it. Okay. But, but probably... In the next lecture, you'll get a very good line in the very chapter we're in. I think it's chapter six, verse 16 or 18, tells you what God wants out of you. But the verse I like to give for this purpose is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I'll repeat it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It, it's one that'll always get you through because there won't be anything happen to you that isn't common with everybody. And God will never tempt you or test you what you're over, what you're able to handle. And he will always show you a way out if you love him, okay? Uh, always. We're, 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 you know, a lot of this hard times we're in are hype. If you've used your head and you use common sense, a lot of it is just hype. So you, wanna, you want to stay ahead of the ball, okay? Pay attention and stay ahead of the game, and you'll you'll be just fine. Okay. Um, Elaine from I don't know where Elaine's from. It doesn't. Don't know. Anyway, we'll get the question. You know where you're at, don't you, dear? We all sin, but God says, "Ask and you will be forgiven." If He forgives us, then why are we going to be judged? It's payday. You've got a crown of righteousness to receive there. If you miss judgment, you would miss that. Your righteous robes, you, you receive those at judgment. You, don't you want your righteous robes or do you want to be naked? Okay. I mean, you sure want to make judgment. That's, God is not an evil person. He's not the one with horns and a pitchfork. When he judges us, he's very fair and he gives you everything you've got coming to you. If you're a good person, all you've got coming to you is wonderful. It's his love. If you're a bad person, you're going to get everything you've got coming to you and it's going to be correction, okay? And so it will be. So that's why repenting, he's, when, when our father forgives, he said, do not bring that up to me again. I don't want to think about it again. So he's not going to bring that up on Judgment Day. It's gone. Blotted out. Lynn from Kentucky. Where in the Bible says, does it say, I am against those who teach my children to fly to save their souls? I'm asked that question quite a bit, I guess, because I repeat it. Ezekiel chapter 13. It begins by talking to the daughters of Jerusalem that so... Uh, kerchiefs or pillowcases, if you like, and sew them and place them over the outreach saving arms of Almighty God with their own doctrine of salvation, that is to say, teaching people to fly to save their souls. Isn't that ridiculous? How silly can it be? And, and then God makes the statement in verse 20 or 25, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. Boy, that sounds pretty final to me, but uh, I guess a lot of people don't believe God. I don't know. Um, Colleen from Tennessee. My son is in a nursing home, age 42. He has mental illness plus several other conditions. 
Um, my son, when he was in his right mind, believed like a, world, a, a certain belief. Uh, he has not been saved. Is there any hope for him? Will he go to heaven when he dies? He says he is saved. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that if he loves the Lord. You know, our Father, uh, when someone is handicapped, that's innocency, okay? We serve a God of love, not a God of hate, okay? We serve a God of compassion. He has much compassion for those that are mentally handicapped, and, and He loves them. And that certainly uh, is, a, is a, a line of innocency as a small child, okay? So you're wasting your time worrying about your son's salvation. Okay. Uh, Debbie from Texas. Does Cain and his descendants and children born from the fallen angels have a chance for salvation? What does John 3.16 say? Whomsoever will. Cain, now, now Satan cannot be saved because God has already passed sentence on him in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. But whomsoever will, that means any time a person, whether they're a child of the devil, if they believe in Jesus Christ, then they become a child of God, okay? Salvation is open to them. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's letter to you, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. You enjoy it. But most of all, God loves you for it. It makes Father's Day for you to study the letter He's written to you. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, He will always bless you. Now, one thing most important, though, you listen to me good now. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. Know why? Because Jesus Yahshua, He is the Living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.